essentially the case, he puts himself into Lali's mind, which plugs him into her body. And here's how Gibson describes it. Case he, the new switch, the abrupt jolt into other flesh, matrix, not patrix, but matrix gone, a wave of sound and color. She was moving through a crowded street, past stalls, vending discount software, prices felt penned on sheets of plastic, fragments of music from countless speakers, smells of free monomers, patties of fine pearl. For a few frightened seconds, the case fought helplessly, trying to control her body. Then he willed himself into passivity. He became the passenger behind her eyes. Her body language was disoriented. Her style foreign. She seemed continually on the verge of... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> her body language was disoriented, her style foreign. She seemed continually on the verge of colliding with someone, but people melted out of her way, stepped sideways, made room. How you doing, Case? He heard the words and felt her form them. She slid a hand into her jacket, her fingertips warmly moving towards her breast and circling a nipple under warm silk. The sensation made him catch his breath. She laughed, but the link one way. He had no way to reply. I'm not going to talk about the many fascinating implications for the body that this new technology not yet to be invented has. I shall skip over the many questions that it would be intriguing to try to answer, not least of them questions about the collapse of gender that the imagined technology permits. I shall not ask nor even try to answer questions like, did Case feel the stimulation of his nipple as Molly did hers? I won't ask, did she feel the sensuous touch of her nipple for the first time? A new, that is, twice, at the same time as her own nipple, and as Case feeling her, feeling him, feeling herself. Surely, though the transmission is one way, Molly's not engaged in a monologue or a monotact, but a dialogue or a diatact, a diapath, a diapathic telepathic communication, or better, a tri-tact a tripath at once bisexual and trisexual. You know what a trisexual is, it's someone who will try and be sexual. No, at once <laughs> bisexual and trisexual, feeling the nipple like that third sex invented somewhere between them, lost in the telepathic transmission affected by this technology. Those are not the questions I'm going to address. Rather, I'm going to address just the technology. Just the technology itself, looking at this as if Molly is saying, yes, I'm here when Case picks up the phone. I want to look at this hyper-virtual, multi telephonic device, or not telephonic, but teletactic, telepathic device. And I want to understand why we can't get there from here. <coughs> In doing so, I hope to unravel the entire scientific project. <laughs> a modest event that we'll see before your eyes in the next 20 minutes. But to show you how serious modern science is about this, I picked this off the internet just before I came. I didn't really have a chance to read it. It's by Agliotti and Cortese and Fancini. Its title is Rapid Sensory Remapping in the Adult Human Brain as inferred from phantom breast perception. <laughs> I couldn't make this up. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I didn't ask a title search for phantom breast perception. I probably 
because I didn't have the wit. What I asked for was uh, neuro, neuroplasticity, a uh, concept in neurology that is very exciting now, the idea that nerves are evolving and the attempt to build machines to imitate the ways in which nerves evolve. This is from a publication called Neuro Report. 1994, January 12th. This is current stuff. It's an article, get it there. And here's the subject. I'm just reading this, I should just read the abstract title, search, and go home. Because here's just how it reads Massive cortical reorganization, primary somatosensory cortex, peripheral nerve injury. I wonder if your nervous system is injured if you try to feel your nipple like the nipple of an opposite gender or somebody attached to your body. Motor maps, plasticity, amputation, neural reorganization in adults. This nipple touching is not for children. Let's try this at home. Neural plasticity, somatosensory systems, phantom breast sensations, and breast cancer. <laughs> what I would try to understand is why if we pursue this technology, it will inevitably cause breast cancer in women and men, why this cancerous technology is a route that we driven down with the wrong assumptions. Those of you who uh, know my work know that what I'm trying to do is bracket alphabetic consciousness and its aberration. And the only way to do that is to find some place to stand outside that era, that aberrant era that began about 3,500 years ago in the desert of Sinai, or better yet, probably less than that, 3,000 years ago when the Phoenicians brought the alphabet to the Greeks and the Greeks perfected it. You probably know the story. Most of you who were brought up in a British or Western European tradition believe that the Phoenicians had the first alphabet. And they invented the first alphabet for the Greeks. That's what Havelock says, that's what Arm says, and that's what McLuhan says. You know that uh, Havelock and Arm and McLuhan were all students of each other. It's very interesting. <laughs> uh, it's true. It's quite true. And, um, but the fact is that the alphabet as an idea was not invented by the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians invented nothing. They were the first capitalists. They were just traced. The alphabet was invented by Hebrew slaves working the turquoise lines for Pharaoh at the South Sinai. And they were trying to come up with a code, a kind of jazz, that would elude the discovery of the Pharaoh slave masters. And so they started scrolling signs that were surely phonetic. The trouble was that their alphabet was, was very crude and inefficient had no vowels. So it was very hard to communicate un unambiguously in writing, and therefore every word that they wrote would be highly ambiguous. But this kind of primitive alphabet gave rise to a consciousness which if only we could recapture would give us a place to stand outside the aberrant history of Western techno-culture since the Greeks perfected the alphabet by adding vowels. The Hebrew alphabet had 22 elements, the Greek 26, actually 28, and added vowels, thus perfecting the communication, making it clearly technical, transparent, providing the ability for people to say to each other what they need, which is a horrible prospect for the West Bank. Uh, for me, the project I'm seeking is to show the superstition involved in imagining these technologies technology of phantom breast perception that will somehow be corrected by a machine, the technology of telepathy, which makes us believe we can have some computer-mediated matrix that will allow Pace to feel Molly stimulate her empathy. Stand, finding a place to stand apart is my project, and the word superstition means to stand apart or above and bear witness, hopefully not false witness. The other place we can stand apart is to inhabit the virtual future, which we're all imagining, and bracket the alphabetic age that starts about 2000 BC, or 1000 BC, and goes to our second millennium here in America and Europe, and everywhere else it's been busy on. In order to be truly superstitious, we have to find that moment we're in now, this slow apocalypse, as we switch cognitive modes to anticipate a technology which we feel to be embraced by, which is why we're here. In 
In order to do that, you have to be a kind of card-carrying member of a paranoid apocalyptic group. The tropers showed us that. You have to be paranoid apocalyptic to understand this slow switching of cognitive load. Um, the drive to achieve presence is the primary characteristic of the alphabet. Drive to achieve total intimacy through a mechanic, through a technique. The drive to summon a resurrection, a positive epistemology, a grand unified theory, a theory of everything, a physics, a total epistemology that is the disease of the alphabetic consciousness. It leads to the delusion that we can make our bodies present to each other to make a present of our bodies to each other via technology, the goal of Hollywood and the internet. All our communications drive to this telepathy and they always have. Communications has always been mapped on the vector of the trajectory that leads to telepathy as we why communicate and we have in each other's minds and in each other's minds. The urge to reveal, the urge to make ourselves present. This exposes the deepest currents of our desires, the strongest hallucinations of Western culture. The question is not whether it's good or bad, but how we think we achieve it. In order to understand how we think we're going to achieve it, we have to look at the nerve. If you're taught, as I was, when I was just a lowly alphabetic consciousness, you were probably taught the nerve looks something like this. The typical nerves, all right? What's that? It's like, a, it's like a cable, an underwater insulated cable. My typical nerves have got a little diagram like that. There's the synapse, the dendrite, excuse me, the dendrite, the nucleus, the axon, it's a wire, it's a telephone wire. In fact, uh, my teacher was Bernie Katz. MIT, and here's what he gave us. The myelinated segments of our nerve fibers are the nearest biological approach to submarine cables on the nature scale, in which electric signals are conducted along the cylindrical axon core that is separated from the conductive tissue fluid by a concentric insulating sheet. In other words, it's a telephone wire. Right? Hello, Central. <laughs> Molly is just answering the telephone when she touches her nipple. She's saying, Yes, I'm here. You were probably also taught that this is where the action was, where the rubber met the road. If you lived here, you were between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> <laughs> this is the synapse, isn't it? Where all the action takes place. It's very neat. The synaptic space, the post synaptic membrane, the dendrite, and that was that was squeezed as much as possible, wasn't it? Uh, that is mechanized. I mean, people seem to learn what it is, right? We have many ways in our culture to refuse this model. One way is pain, the slash and burn. Another way is this kind of analysis. I hope. However, this is what a pigmented section of dead neuron looks like. And here's an artist's rendition of what really happens <laughs> among the dendrites. And the same artist's idea <coughs> of what it would look like to have it so These ain't telephone cables, are they, folks? And in fact, all the research in neurophysiology, which is suppressed on a regular basis every time someone tries to do sensory motor remapping of the pain and breast perception by a neurophysiological manipulation of telephone wires. <coughs> Finds out that neurons ain't machines, and this is why I don't believe some of this evidence. Neurons act directly as neurotransmitters, but they also act at a distance as neuromodulators. In other words, to put it in less technical talk, neurons transmit information true, but even as the information or the current travels the length of your body, they modulate that information. They emit, or seek, or weep, or beat, or see, or blossom, various chemicals which change.
change the ecology or environment in which they and their internet partners <coughs> cooperate. They innovate large areas of their local ecology non-trivially and non-specifically. They're bleeding over each other. They're infecting each other. That is, they can affect the responsivity of hundreds of other neurons, hundreds of neurons away, very rapidly. What does this provide them? Just about anything we do. From the internet onto something more fleshly. It's not one to many, but many to many, because the, the project of these neurons is recursive. The connectivities of neurons change as they go. They are not stable entities like underwater marine cables. Within five minutes of learning a task, the physiology of a neuron is altered. <coughs> five minutes of learning a task, they structurally change even down to the molecular level. Neurons create their own pathways with use, but they also wither with neglect, use it or lose it principle. Neurons are used or lost. They wither, they die, they grow, they change. Neurons can have use for more than one neurotransmitter. By the way, name a neurotransmitter, anybody. Serotonin, right? 5 hydroxytryptamine 5 hd 5 usually HT5 sub 2, right? HT5 sub 2 is a hormone. And you know what that means. H Serotonin, the, the basic neurotransmitter, the band in which these nerves see, is hormonal. And hormones are the least understood, not just biochemical, the chemical that we see in nature, that are most complex. They carry and use information as well as the nerves. <coughs> we don't know today, in 1995, how neurons hold signals which should signal to us that there's something wrong with the model. In other words, neurophysiologists who insist on the mechanical model of a neuron don't know how neurons hold information even instantaneously. They know that there's a transmission of charge that charge is modulated as number one says as the information goes across the axis of the nerve. Neurons are willful little children. They like to invade unoccupied spaces for no apparent reason. They like to make messes and sandboxes of the brain world they live in. They abhor by the rest of the vacuum. The distinction between soma axon dendrite, if you have that cable through the nerve in your mind, the distinction between these is unstable. Sometimes a nerve body acts like a dendrite, that is, it emits chemicals that act as neurotransmitters. Sometimes the polarity of a nerve switch, even though they are structurally quite different, they look different. One's bulbous, the other one is branch like. Axon branches can act as deep multiplexers or filters. Um, that means that they filter signals proportionate to their physical thickness so that their thickness matches the frequency of the signals they filter. <coughs> In other words, the thicker the wire, the different uh, function that they serve. The trouble is that they can think and feel time periods as small as minutes. The same nerve will flip in and thin as kind of go on diets or big fat on what function they're asked to serve. The other thing is 90% of neuronal action is inhibitory, not excitatory. Actually this serves not for nerves but for the hormones in which they they neurons uh, live in serotonin hormones which actually seem to suppress and transmission of signals. They don't uh, propel signals, they suppress them. Serotonin, when introduced to the brain, actually cures uh, a bad trait. It helps stabilize people. 
In short, the nerve is not the water telephone station. It's autocorrect, it builds itself into those laws. It's ecological in the sense that an effect here has consequences there that in turn impinge upon the origin. Certainly, it's self contextualizing like any natural language. Uh, the nerve is a letter in the alphabet, as grammar you haven't understood. It fills spaces, it builds its own connections, it becomes more labile. Use it registers recursive effects. As Norman Wiener said, Godfather of the Cybernetic Apocalypse, quote, cybernetics banishes the mechanism, vitalism, duality, the limbo of badly posed questions. The question may be posed badly in the first place. Just to add one more bit of evidence from Walter Freeman, my favorite neurophysiologist, says. The nerve, our research has now revealed flaws in the interpretation of the brain as a machine. He's a neurophysiologist who's been studying olfactory senses and smell, one of the most interesting of our five senses, the one least exploited in the internet. When are they going to get smell vision on the World Wide Web? That's what I want to do. That's what I'll sign on. Um, neural activity patterns in the olfactory bulb cannot be equated with internal representations of particular odorants, smells in the brain, for several reasons. First, if you present a smell to the system, it does not lead to any specific activity that you can find. Second, odor specific activity patterns are dependent upon the behavioral response. Third, patterned neural activity is context dependent. The introduction of a new smell into your repertoire leads to changes in the patterns of all your previously learned smells. It's not like adding a new tool to your toolkit, but it changes your notion of smelling. It changes the ontology of the smell. You stink and smell differently to yourself and others when you smell something new. Taken together, all these recursive and Contextualizing practices in the brain teach us that we who have looked at activity patterns as internal representations of events have somehow misinterpreted data. Our findings indicate that patterned neural activity correlates best with reliable forms of interaction in a context that is behaviorally and environmentally co defined by something beyond our language's ability to express it. There is nothing intrinsically representational about this process until the observer is on the scene. It is the experimenter himself or herself who infers what the observed activity patterns represent. In other words, he or she comes armed with the explanation found in the nervous system, but he or she is looking in the wrong place. There is no representation in the brain. The nerve and the nervous system cannot represent the world for our mind. And in turn, we cannot represent the nerve for ourselves, especially if you especially assume it is some kind of a machine. What I'd like to do then is superstitiously the nerve. Try to recorporate, re understand the nerve in some way that might make sense for the invention of this superstitious technology that we all come here to celebrate before it's been invented. The way I'm going to do that is to ignore my own Olive Puffian consciousness, my Hebrew alphabetic ideas, and read the nerve through reading that other Molly literature. That other Molly who answers the telephone and says yes. That other Molly who is the object of a one-way transmission of telepathic information at the end of James Joyce's visits. As you recall, Molly says, Molly says, and I at first in her, in her last great monologue, which is a monologue, she says, at first I put my arms around him and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts. Yes. It's hard not to compare 
Let me read, not Joyce anymore, because we've all read Joyce. Let me read someone who reads this passage in Joyce, which will allow me to read the passage in Neuromancer, which allows me to reread the Nerf, the failed project of all of Western epistemology, this attempt to read the Nerf. This writer writes, Molly, then, if we're to understand her, has evoked the question of self sending sans voyer, and in the end, she's sending herself to someone who says yes without reading, what the French argot babylizes under the terms of sans voyer, which means you cut it off with oneself or someone else. I'll read this author reading Joyce, reading Duramance, or reading the Nerve again. Bloom is essentially on the telephone, hooked up to a powerful network, this author. He belongs in his essence to a polytelephonic structure. Bloom is waiting for someone to say, yes, yes, I'm here. Beginning with the telephonic yes, indicating that someone's on the other end of the line, that there is indeed another voice, if not an answering machine, on the other end. When at the end of the book, Molly says, yes, yes, she's answering a request, but a request that she requests to have answered. She is at the telephone, and then I turn it down my breaths, all perfectly, and his heart was going like mad, yes, I'm saying, yes. Then he keyed the new switch, the abrupt jolt into another flesh. She, uh, her body language was disordered. How are you doing, Case? He heard the words and felt her form then. She slid a hand into her jacket, a fingertip circling a nipple under a warm silk. The sensation made him catch his breath. She laughed, the link in one way, he had no way to reply. This, says the other author, who reads Ulysses, which enables me to read your answer and allows me to read the mirror, writes, This is what I call the grammar phone effect. Yes, grammar phones itself. It writes and hears itself. And telegrammar phones itself. Who's this author? I've been warned not to mention this man because it contaminates this conference with Judaic prophecy because it is the self stylizing second coming of a Jewish Elijah prophet, which demolishes a Delusian Guatarian delusion of action in the real world at any such academic conference. And that person is no other than. He won't even say the word. I'm trying not to say the word because I don't want to be the one to contaminate this conference by pushing the D. Jewish prophecies. That D word. Rod <laughs> Derisa. No one's going to say it. Derrida, in this essay about it, Ulysses' gramophone, which allows you to read Molly's gramophone and virtual reality, which helps you negate the nerve of the entire Western epistemological project, <laughs> makes fun of the mechanized programs of knowledge that are the fruit of the Christological episteme, that itself is the fruit of the Greek perfection of the alphabet that came from the hand of the vowels, the perfect Hebrew instrument of an ambiguous alphabet. Slaves and players of jazz. Derrida contrasts this to the laughter, the yes laughter, that both our Mollies use, both Molly 1 and Molly 2 laugh. The yes laughter that comes from the bodies of Mollies and the bodies of his texts. Derrida imagines, quote, a department of Joycean studies under the authority of Elijah, professor, chair, and if you remember, uh, Jewish families put out a chair for Elijah the prophet for his return. And in fact, on the coast of Haifa, just below the, Israel's a very long beach with very bad politics. And <laughs> Israel's a very long beach with very bad politics. And one place over this beach is a beautiful bluff 
very fine sand, beautiful Mediterranean waves coming in. On top of this bluff uh, that begins the Carmel Mountain Range, there's a giant bank of jam. I mean, it's about 40 feet high, 20 feet wide. And it's put up there by Messianic Jews, uh, Jews of Hasidic Jews, black robes, who believe that Elijah is going to come to the West with the setting sun and sit in his chair. Um, and Gary Dye uses this image to portray himself to the Joycean Symposium, the meeting of the National, International Joyce Society, as an Elijah uh, professor and chair of Joyce Study. And in doing so, he imagines that this chair has agreed to buy an nth generation computer, that's Gary Dye's terms, an nth generation computer that will correlate a table of all the occurrences of the word yes. Ulysses. And Derrida Dunn has already done some of this computational work himself. In fact, he's counted 222 yeses, but only in the French version. He didn't trust the English version. And there's 79 alone in Molly's monologue, some in other languages. Quote, beyond this perilous counting of explicit yeses, the Joycean chair would naturally demand, and here I'll be paraphrasing, two tasks impossible for any computer of which we possess the concept of control today. One would be the different modalities, tonalities, and subtly different categories of yeses which the human can utter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We. Yes. But even if we could give the computer the ability to, de de to, de to detect, I wrote that. Detect the human subtleties of tonal changes. The remains of a quasi transcendental yes laughter can no longer give rise to a protection ruled by binary logic. In other words, the nervous underwater table telephonic machinery of the computer cannot compute the yeses in the Joyce's uh, more neurological computer. No computer today can enumerate these interlaces to read the music of Ulysses. What I say or write here today, says Derrida, or writes Derrida, is a small piece in regard to that other text, which would be that unheard of and impossible to achieve computer. Derrida. Second reason is agreeing to the computer project itself is itself a yes. A yes, which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I too have answered by becoming the leader of an artificial intelligence research project whose primary goal is to sabotage all future artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> for this, by the way, to show you why America is the promised land, for this, I convinced the Henry R. Luce Foundation to give me $307,000 over a three-year period. The corruption of any Elijah profit on the seat of the Henry R. Luce Foundation is bound to succeed. Um, yes, it is to laugh. Um, About five minutes. I'm, I'm almost there. Agreeing to the computer project is itself a yes, which is at once an assent to an epistemological view of a totalizing interpretation of Ulysses. And at the same time, it is a denial of any such possibility. For how can any computer count the yeses in which this is its rise? In short, this nerve. is a rhizome, not a machine, a Deleuzian Guattari <coughs> rhizome, a burrow, an uncentered and meandering growth, a complex aleatory network of pathways drowning in a bath of hormones, the antithesis of a root tree, logical structure, or an arborescence. Arborescences are hierarchical, aren't they? They're stratified totalities that impose limited and regulated connections between their components. Rhizomes, by contrast, we know, are non hierarchical, horizontal multiplicities, internets that can't be subsumed in a unified structure, even though DARPA, the Defense Agency Research Project, gave it birth, whose components form random, unregulated networks in which any element can be connected to any other element, and there's no privileged on-ramp, no special point of entry that gives meaning to the whole. 
Hence, the nervous system that means the machine gives us a view of a Delusian machine, a rhizomatic machine, and a rhizomatic technology and epistemology which challenges every other possible epistemology, especially the one we're in now. The Newtonian model of the nerve is reductive, it blocks progress, it takes the life away from the reality of the nerve and the systems in which the nerve inhabits itself, that is, the human body and the brain or the mind. It takes life away from the notion that this touch of my nipple is different from any other touch of anyone else's nipple. It takes life away from the reality of inhabiting the human body and using the word enervating. The Lozen Guattari and Derridian philosophies shares, share the following characteristics. They are both spatial and temporal. They are both differing and deferring. They are both, they both uh, allow the impossibility of presence, but the facticity of always has been or about to be. They are both structural and genetic. They both suggest that reality inhabits the space between terms and the movement of space in its spaces terms. He is no stable identity, but differs from itself. If we lose any Derrida, both call a singulacro. Reality does not, in their hands, obey a logic of referentiality, like our nervous uh, our neural neurology reports about the nervous system itself. The nerve, therefore, is the perfect delusion Derridian object, a groundless transcendental ground, something that is ontologically and logically problematic all the way through. I'm going to stop with this suggestive and superstitious critique of Western neurophysics and our alphabetic consciousness. But before I leave, let me confess that I have learned from Deleuze and Guattari that an idle philosophy such as this one does not mean the text for action. For without leaving the text for action, we are enervated. Therefore, I'm going to ask you to unbutton your pants <laughs> or slip your hand under your shirt to warm your fingers and slowly with your eyes closed. Perhaps snake your fingers as you warm them down your shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Which doesn't mean, of course, that we can't live parasitically off the, the mother of nature. So, what I might say is that um, uh, it's, it's accepted that, you know, that science, we never actually, science never actually answers the whole question. Well, what happens is that the fact that it makes progress allows you to answer more of the question, right? Well, if you lose sight of that purposes, yeah. then it ceases to make sense. You know, it's the whole point. You know, you, you, the reason you're studying it is presumably to cure neural diseases or whatever. That's the reason why you do it. And I don't understand why you're trying to un undermine you know, that, that basic process. Because I don't believe in the progress. Well, that means it's the thing that's good thing. No. I think it creates. Um, isn't that obvious? Isn't it self evident that you've ever taken a plane and gotten engineers? <laughs> no, you wouldn't be here. But lots of people do, and they don't get to ask that question. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm sorry. No, but I don't know. I don't believe in the progress. I, I like to assist it along whenever I can. But I don't believe in it. What's that? Which point would you like to stop progressing? 
I, I, I don't oh, speak that know. language. I'm really sorry. No, I'm, you're saying you, you don't like the idea of progress. I didn't say I don't like the idea of progress. You don't believe it. I don't believe science progresses in the way. And I don't think curing this is, is which, which an appropriate thing. Which achievements of science would you like to get rid of? <laughs> which achievements of science? I think Levi's genes. Bread, no, I, I love science. I mean, I, I, I'm a scientist. Hell, I love sort science. Of you're a scientist. Sort of. I love science deeply. I have a deep, passionate, nipple-like attachment <laughs> to science. But um, I don't believe in the terms that define its progress or mean to civilization or its uh, kind of funky uh, ability to add to the storehouse of knowledge. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't even think anymore in those terms because I have children. Yeah, yeah, control over nature. Yeah, control, mastery over nature, yeah. and, you know, all those right. great things, right? <laughs> so, uh, I, instead of taking this the kind of approach to science that the professor has been putting forward, which is the notion of progress and the notion of science as discovering theory from discovery. Discovering pre existing truths. What about taking the kind of approach to science of Donna Haraway or uh, uh, Bruno Latour, which is about the production of scientific fact? I mean, both Bruno Latour and Donna Haraway share this common feature, which I think is extremely useful in any performance. Yeah. They believe in the performance of the body in knowledge. And they sometimes do it themselves. Donna, Donna yeah. better than Bruno Latour, right? And they perform their knowledge, and that's and, and yet they use science. And I'm sure every time they give a talk, someone says, "Well, you're using science," and that's an appropriate question. That is the question. But I, I can't speak outside of my phonetic uh, vowel alphabet. I just can't. So I use the terms I have, like everyone else here. The technology that doesn't quite work. Into that, this room, which is a technological artifact, to make the best sense we can. That sounds like a little bit of a test. It was the idea that I love it. Sorry, it's fun. Okay. Let's um, see if this shoe fits. In your performance, it sounds to me that as you de mechanize the neuron, you turn the neuron into a homunculus. You've made the neuron, or in your quotation, you've made the neuron have all the traits of free choosing human beings, in its traditional human conception of the free human being. Uh, I'd even add that you've turned the neuron into something heroic, although you didn't, you didn't actually attribute heroism. But if you combine the fact that uh, Ninety percent of the activity of the neuron is inhibitory, and both Molly Bloom and Molly Millions are saying yes. <laughs> that that ten percent of yes saying is glorious, <laughs> wonderful purpose of existence. Blah blah blah. So you, what you, what it seems to me you've done is you've mapped the heroic human. The free human of theistic religion onto the neuron, giving. Now, I don't know whether it's chicken or egg here, which direction you want to go. Do you want to say, we now discover our freedom in our physiology, or whether you want to say, our freedom is based upon our physiology? But you put, you've made those neurons into mollies. In essence, you're saying I've made a romantic hero out of a neuron or written a neuromance <laughs> <laughs> about the nerve. And we're in this together. We do this every every city we play. <laughs> um, and I mean, if you want to project your bourgeois values, <laughs> you've got a lot of nerve. That's all I can say. Uh, a lot of nerve. Uh, I, I, you know, I guess if you see nice liberal humanistic deliverance in my in the portrait of 
archaeological evidence that the nerve. What I see is a bunch of scientists struggling against the paradigm, and the only way they can do it is to grasp these terms and all of my categories of things from the article. So yeah, there's only a couple of modes we have to imagine short of performance. And that's that's why I in all my answers, I use the word performance. So if you perform the nervous system, it's a lot different than talking about it with a scout loaded alphabet. And the outmoded alphabet's going to trap us into science or romantic theorism or bourgeois But performing is very different. So I, I would keep my nipple every time I can to, to get that effect. That's what it's Yes, sir. I'm, I'm reminded in more ways than one of uh, Gregory Bateson and how much about my is digital and analog and the very different of my mind seem to come close to your alphabet in your own. And I'd just like to comment on that. But secondly, um, he would also speak about how things would be here at one threshold analog and at another digital. Yes. So to what extent is what you're talking about? Yes. It's, it's already premised on the alphabetic, that's the way we discussed it. Uh, you know, one comes out of the other and turns into the other, and that's just the way it always is. So uh, do we need to go all the way, or do we need to oscillate between those, those modes of perception? The question is excellent, but you want me to answer it sociologically. Ooh, you like to be that fun. Okay, yeah, so let's, use the, let's, use the, let's use the neurology as a metaphor for the sociology. Yeah. Okay. Why not? Why not? <laughs> okay. So Bateson, Bateson, and almost every researcher and academic who's tried to fathom the brain, says exactly what you said, which is that at certain thresholds, the potential is digital or binary, if you like. And after that, it becomes something else. Analog is a poor word, so on basic uses. Analog also always includes uh, representation. The poor form of okay, much better, much simpler, or rhizome or something like that. So the nervous system, uh, to a certain threshold, acts like telephone cable. And that's the threshold at which most neurophysiologists prefer to study that. It's the one they can take out. In fact, they study dead nerves from this topic uh, because it will behave within the digital or binary thresholds. Um, but the nervous system obviously does both all the time. And it, it's, if you want to look at the dynamic, and I'm not talking sociologically, the 90% of repression is spent controlling the 10% of expression. And 90% of repression uh, uh, is very effective at keeping things in order. If we abandon the digital analog dualism, you know, there's an old story about a, a, a carpenter, I'll finish. There's an old story about a, a Jewish carpenter who was stranded on a desert island, like Robin Dyfeld said. Uh, and he's stranded on a desert island, and uh, he's there for 20 years, and he builds himself a whole town, and a Dutch sea captain comes to rescue him, and the Dutch sea captain says, let me take you off this island. He says, first, let me show you what I built. And he says, okay, okay, he was there, and he shows him the bakery he built, and the, uh, the butcher he built, and the house he built, and the Dutch sea captain looks up on the hill, it's two giant structures, it's two buildings. The Dutch sea captain says, What's, what are those two buildings up there? And the Jewish Robinstein Crusoe says, Oh, those are my two synagogues, my two temples. He says, Two temples? Why don't you build two of them? He says, You see the one on the left? I never go to that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best way I can think of explaining the binary digital analog. <laughs> I didn't use Derrida. Okay. Someone else mentioned it first. <laughs> so, I mean, just a couple of quick kind of um, corrections to try out. The one with the Dante standpoint outside of the consciousness doesn't the instruction in general have a lot to do with thinking about that desire? I mean, yeah. I think it'll be all this. Yes, right. Second thing is, um, the same digital analog kind of oscillation or uh, moving between the thresholds we're talking about could be brought up by any computer scientist as how the machine itself works at some level, it's analog, 
and if an appropriate kind of discipline, you can extract digital behavior from it. Or the other way around, right? you can build up a platform of digital behaviors with some human observer as an animal. Yeah, but I'm talking about you can, kind you of make a, I'm talking about the way that it's you're talking about a screensaver that a floating analog clock. Have you seen those speaking hands? Okay, so both ways because of the level of semiconductors. There's only continuous yeah, right. Okay, so. If the machine, in general, in your presentation, has been somehow developed, did something that you say you affirm, but it's really only an answering machine, so it's a denial of possibility in general. But one says yes to it when one affirms a machine. You're not really affirming anything to the current other. You're affirming just the product of the outfit consciousness and all its clamping down and restriction and cutting up in a digital way. But the machine itself is already inhabited by this threshold, which includes both. Isn't there a way of affirming the machine that I'm sorry, this is really complicated. Isn't there a way of affirming the machine that isn't just saying I say yes to this thing that I want to get away from? It? Yeah, and Gary Dog gave the answer and I quoted his answer and I'll repeat it. Can you explain any point of which is that uh, when the chair of Joyce's studies buys the machine, saying yes to the machine, which is the same as saying yes, there's no way this machine can answer my questions. But when we buy a computer, we're saying there are things this computer can't do. And to what extent am I going to enslave myself? To but that seems to be doing the same thing as saying you know what a neuron is. You're saying you know what the machine is. But it's precisely because the computer is the slave or the robot uh, machine. Or a sentence of different things. Right? Buy, the, buy the computer or take the robot. Oh, but I had to make those choices, so I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.